Welcome to the webinar. Let's start now. Uh, my name is Paul Wong. I'm your host today. This webinar is part of a webinar series in research data information integrations, a mouthful. A unifying theme of this um, webinar series is the concept of research data management life cycle. As you can see, that's the uh, research data management life cycle. Uh, the life cycle approach allows us to look at different business activities and the underlying IT system that support these uh, um, activities as a coherent set of purposeful activities and systems to help organizations to achieve outcomes and uh, best practices. Now, some of these outcomes of better managed data may include more efficient reporting to funding agencies, uh, raising the international profile of an uh, institutions or attracting uh, new collaborators from uh, industries, governments and other research organizations. In terms of our next webinar in the series, um, as you can see, uh, the next step in the uh, taking the life cycle approach is the ethical approvals relating to research data. Um, we're currently having uh, discussions with a number of uh, potential speakers and we will announce the um, date uh, shortly hopefully within a week or so. Now for those in the audience who are from research offices or have involvement in excellence in research for Australia, ANS is pleased to announce that uh, our DOI minting service has been extended to include great literatures and other form of uh, non-traditional research output. We have scheduled a webinar uh, on 11th of May. Now, if you go to the ANS homepage and scroll down, you see the event calendar. And if you click onto that, you see a Google calendar pops up and just go to the uh, 11th of May day and click open and you see the details, registration details and the details of the webinar. Uh, I encourage you uh, to, to attend that webinar. So first off, uh, we would like to acknowledge our co-sponsor, the Australian Asians. Research Management Society and uh, uh, Council of Australian University Librarians. Uh, ANS is funded through the Commonwealth under the ANCRIS program, so we would like to thank uh, our sponsor, financial sponsor, for uh, providing us with, with the fund to uh, do the kind of work that we do. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our um, three speakers, Matthias, Katrina and Maud. Um, they are respectively from Curtin Universities, uh, University of Sydney, and University of New South Wales. They're all from a uh, library with a uh, library background. Uh, welcome speakers, and thank you for coming uh, today to share your experience. So, thank you to Anne's for having me. My presentation is about, well, data management plans, of course, uh, and how we try to get the researchers as they gather at the waterholes. My name, there we go, uh, I'm Matthias Lippis. Um, my title is Coordinator Research Services, but I like to call myself a data librarian. If you need to tweet, call or email me, there are my details. Now, um, I always forget to put in a slide introducing Curtin University itself because I assume everybody knows of us. Um, Curtin University is the largest university in Western Australia. We're a member of the Australian Technology Network. Uh, our research profile is growing, um, I think is the best way to put it. So traditionally not a very strong research focus, but we are absolutely growing our capability in that area at the moment quite rapidly. So I don't like using the analogy of carrots and sticks anymore. Um, I prefer to talk about water holes after a conversation with Jens Klump at CSIRO. Carrots and sticks, well, they, of course, carrots are good things, sticks are bad things, but really when it comes to research administration and research management, most things are a combination of good and bad, depending on what point of view um, you take. So we like to put some things in place so that when researchers congregate at the waterhole to get something that they need, um, that's where we approach them and involve them in data management planning, for example. So uh, data management planning is just one of the larger, one of many services available at Curtin University. Um, we have training, which is delivered by the library. There are monthly data management seminars, and I just finished a month of very intensive seminars. I delivered about eight over the course of three weeks. 
We have a library guide on research data management. There is the data management planning tool, uh, storage for data, uh, the R drive, and um, a facility for publishing data, uh, including DOI minting. And of course, we also provide advice to researchers on uh, all sorts of things around data management, like ethics, IP, grant applications, so on and so forth. Now, I'd like to quickly talk about what a researcher actually is. From <laughs> Depending on who you talk to in the university, they, they're mostly concerned with just one kind of researcher, staff or students. I like to think about all researchers, doesn't matter where they are, how early they are or how late they are in their career. Um, I especially like to get them while they're young, um, train up early career researchers in good data management practices. Now the, the services that we have developed at the university were very uh, developed under a very, very strong collaboration between the library, the IT department, the Office of Research Development and the Records and Information Management um, team. So we all came together providing our own expertise in particular areas, but it wasn't as though just the library was developing these things in a silo. We, it was certainly a strong collaboration. Now, onto the actual data management planning tool. Um, I am going to, uh, yeah, I, I tend to be quite skeptical of technology working during presentations like this, so I've elected not to give you an in-depth demonstration of our data management planning tool. Um, if you'd like to see it down the line, please get in touch with me and I'll happily organise a screen sharing session or something and walk you through it. So our data management planning tool was developed in-house by our IT department. Uh, development started quite a long time ago, probably about four or five years ago, um, but there was a lengthy hiatus in between. And then eventually they picked it up, polished off what was needed and made it available. So it would have been first available almost two years ago to the month, in fact. Now. At the moment, the data management planning tool is based around a series of pages. There are three pages with open-ended questions with text boxes that researchers can answer. Now, these questions are things like, what does your data cover? Who does it belong to? Who's going to be accessing the data? How is that data going to be safeguarded from human or machine error? So on and so forth. We have deliberately chosen to not moderate them or mark them or put them through an approval process, although there is a, an exception, of course there is, because you'll see shortly we, we have a huge number of data management plans and it would be an incredible workload for somebody to actually have to mark them and provide feedback as they come through. Now the first uh, point, the first waterhole um, that we went to to uh, in embed the data management planning process was to get access to the R drive. So the R drive and the data management planning tool were introduced at the same time and you must create a data management plan in order to apply for a folder on the R drive. Since its inception two years ago, we have been performing regular updates, roughly yearly, to the data management planning tool. We're currently in the process of planning the next phase of enhancements, and they are mostly to do with upcoming integration with uh, an ethics management module that we are also implementing. So the, uh, the R drive, so that, that waterhole, um, it is a very plain and simple network drive. There's no fancy ways of accessing it, but the, um, it is effectively unlimited to researchers. They can ask for as much storage as they need, although we might raise an eyebrow if they need more than five terabytes of storage and have a conversation to see if there's another way to provide them with what they need. They don't need to pay a cent to access this storage, and the storage access controls are on this per person basis. So you can say, I'm collaborating with this researcher from another department. We both need access, but nobody else. Uh, that's a relatively novel thing for our network drives at Curtin University, which are traditionally mostly based around organizational units. Uh, students cannot apply for storage by themselves. They must apply, uh, sorry, the supervisor must apply on their behalf. I mentioned R drive because it was very tightly coupled with the data management plan and of course we we like to think researchers are very interested in having free sort of unlimited storage for their research. I think that's a good way to get them to think about data management planning. So I did mention that we started all of this, the, the um, implementation of things quite some time ago. So in April 
2014 was when we introduced a new research data on primary materials policy and September that year was a soft launch of the planning tool and the R drive. Um, there was an even softer launch in April, but that was more of a prototype to do some usability testing with early adopters. And then we progressively found more watering holes to introduce data management planning tool to. So in January 2015, we introduced stricter research data management for human research ethics. In August, we then added it to higher degree by research students. In September, we hit 1,000 data management plans, which was a pretty exciting time. Uh, then in January this year, uh, it was introduced for animal research ethics. And just the other day, I discovered that some honours and fourth year undergraduate student coordinators were planning to um, introduce stricter research data management for some of their students. Uh, I checked this morning and we have, we're pushing 2,000 data management plans. I think it'll take us about a month to get to that magic number. And then coming up soon, uh, we are implementing um, a human research ethics management module um, component of InfoEd, and that is necessitating some of the changes to our data management planning tool. So uh, stricter research data management is um, a few things combined together. So first up, we have that creation and maintenance of a data management plan. And that is primarily what I would say is responsible for the huge number of plans that we have received. The, we also want researchers to deposit a copy of their data on suitable institutional storage, which might be the R drive, but it could also be one of our other network drives at the university. And we also don't want sensitive data to be stored on personal devices at all, ever. I mean, that, that was always the case, but we've been really highlighting that much more strongly recently. So you might have seen that we revised our data management policy after only a year of it being in place. Um, and the reason why we did that was because we had this lovely policy that was based on very little experience of actually doing it. We, got a, um, we looked at policies from other universities and organisations and put our own together. But then we discovered that when the rubber hit the road that it was lacking in a few places. So we added some much stronger links to the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research. We added a new reference to sensitive data within the policy, and we also had stronger references, well, typo, to data sharing and publication. This is um, the, uh, a pretty chart of um, the data management plans over time. Now, it is over two years, and you can see we've experienced massive growth. Now, I can't point out things on my screen to you, I'm used to giving presentations in person, but you can see there that in, uh, from August to September, when the data management planning tool was made properly public avail publicly available, there was a, a small spike there in growth. But really, it was January 2015 when it was uh, data management planning was made mandatory for ethics, human research ethics approvals, that it shot, started shooting up. In August 2015 was the introduction for higher degree by research students and another spike again. And it's still too early to see if there's been much of a, an impact by the introduction for animal research ethics, but we'll see how we go. Um, we're still experiencing a huge number of new plans every month, and so I think last month we had about 150 new plans. So, data management planning, which I haven't necessarily spoken too much about itself, but what I feel is important is how we've embedded it in different processes um, in the research life cycle. So, you need access to storage, we'd like a data management plan. You need ethics approval, please provide a DMP. And finally, if you want to be a higher degree by research student at Curtin, you need to write a data management plan. So, what's next? Well. We've got 2,000, almost 2,000 data management plans, which in and of itself is an excellent data set that is begging to be analysed. So that's on my list of things to do. And also, to support the introductions of all these mandates, more training, more training, more training for researchers. So, thank you very much. Um, that's it for my presentation. Were, were there any questions? Thank you, Matthias. Uh, we do have a, a questions from the audience. Uh, the question is, how do you balance stricter DMP management against ease of input free tax fields on uh, cr uh, creations of plan? Wait, uh, sorry, could you repeat that, please? Uh, yeah. 
how do you balance uh, the, the strict DMP uh, management uh, against ease of input? So uh, I understand that uh, the DMP management plan uh, is is uh, mandatory uh, for in, in cert, for certain kind of research, uh, and I guess uh, the the question is um, how do you balance the the, the stick and carrot? Um. Well, the <laughs> easy to do. Yes, yeah, so um, we provide an example data management plan and try to provide as much guidance within the tool. So each question has uh, say a few lines saying consider these things, and then there's a link to the guide, the library guide on data management planning. So we try to provide as much assistance there to let the researchers know what they should be thinking about. Now, because we're not marking them, of course, uh, except, sorry, in the case of ethics applications, the, the ethics committee is very interested in certain questions such as who will have access to the data, how are you gathering the data. So the ethics committee does have a close look at that and we'll get back to the researcher to let them know if the answer is sufficient or not. Um, so we, we try to take a very soft touch when we mandate the creation of the tool but in essence, I suppose you could call it a, um, an advocacy tool. So we're advocating better data management planning without necessarily forcing them to, to put things in the right place and have proper um, file management and things like that. Uh, the next question is, is uh, how do you check compliance with uh, the DMPs? Okay, um, so with the... Um, yeah, uh, so ethics at the moment is, uh, until the introduction of the new module next month, ethics is essentially a paper form as well as our application for candidacies for higher degree by research students. They need to attach a data management plan. So the system lets them produce a PDF that they literally staple to their form. Um, and so you check compliance by seeing if the form's there. Uh, the next question is caring and sharing. Oh, sharing is caring. Uh, would you be prepared to share your training documentation so we can see how you are doing it? Happy to share ours. Um, okay, so the, the library guide, the URL is in the slides and uh, will be hopefully distributed afterwards. So the lib library guide is completely openly available. You can have a look at that. And if you'd like a copy of my data management seminar training slides, please email me and I can send them out. Um, I won't make them publicly available because I regularly update them. Okay, we, we've got and I don't want to quite, quite a flood of, of questions coming, but, but I'm uh, mindful of the, of the time. So we'll, we'll share some of these questions um, to the panel discussions. Uh, and um, so hold your thoughts and your questions. We will at this point pass the control to our next speakers. So as Paul mentioned, I'm Katrina McAlpine and I'm the research data manager um, based in the library. And so we actually have a team of four of us who work in the library supporting research data management. So there's myself, um, Jennifer McLean, who's our research data officer, Jean Melzak, who plays a role in digital curation, and Kayla Maloney, who is our data analysis officer. Um, and like Matthias, in this space we have worked in collaboration and partnership with the Research Portfolio and ICT in um, setting up data management tool and policies and processes um, and that's something that's still ongoing. So again, like Matthias, I'm not going to do a live demo but I do have screenshots of the tool and I'm going to talk you through it. But first I thought um, I would just provide a bit of context about um, why we're doing this and how we got here. So. At the University of Sydney, we do have a 2014 research data management policy um, procedures from 2015, and then we have local provisions that are being rolled out across um, at the faculty level. So Sydney Conservatorium of Music and the Faculty of Engineering IT were our early adopters in this space, and that they were actually involved in policy discussion, um, I think, as early as 2013. So these were things that took a, a while to come in, but now that they're here, um, there's more to come. Um, so the policy and the procedures do main, mandate that all researchers, um, that all research at the university must be supported by an RDMP, and the procedures nominate our RDMP tool as this platform to be used. So throughout the policy process, um, there were discussions, and really the feedback was 
that for researchers you want to try to avoid duplicating um, input. So it was really hoped that if we're having an RDMP tool that there could be integration with other systems uh, like Curtin. What we have done is integrate that with the request for storage. So we did have um, a paper or a PDF RDMP checklist that was developed for the Anne Seeding the Commons project and we did then update that form in um, May of 2014. But with the policy having come in and having these two early adopter groups in the form of the Conservatorium and the Faculty of Engineering and IT, we really needed an online tool that was across the whole university um, for researchers to use. So there were discussions, do we integrate this with another process such as the ethics approval process, but not necessarily all research is going to require ethics approval. Um, so we did go with the integrate with storage option. And one of the other drivers for this was around this time the university was implementing um, the research data store for researchers to store their data. And so having the RDMP connected to that helps to provide some context around the content of the research data store and enables um, the university to do some sort of planning in terms of what do we need, you know, how quickly is our storage growing, how, how much is it related to data um, for planning for future infrastructure. So as part of the ANS Metadata Stores project, uh, we had implemented Redbox for our research data registry. And Redbox does have a function, it's a researcher dashboard functionality. And so as part of a pilot, we decided to use that for our RDMP tool. And so that first release was about August 2014, and that came in with the integration of um, request for storage. And really the pilot just continued. Um, so it just continued to grow, and the next major release was in April 2015. Um, and, and in this case, it was an integrating with a request to use high performance computing. So since then, there's been a lot of um, additional enhancement, some integrations, improvements, and trying to fix the workflow so that it's easy for researchers to use as possible, as well as the library and ICT. At the moment, we don't have as many completed plans as Curtin, so I think in my last check we had 680 that have been completed, and so that's per project. Um, researchers should complete an RDMP on a project basis, and they get allocated their storage on a project basis. So if they're working on multiple projects, they should have a different RDMP and a different storage allocation. For those, but I think we do have about 2,000 plans in the system. Um, so some faculties you are required to submit a plan um, with your funding application for internal funding. So some of those some of those researchers will complete a draft plan, submit a PDF of it, and then if if the project goes ahead, they'll go through the submission process. Okay, so. I didn't want to risk a live demo, but I am going to show you what parts of the tool look like, not all of it. Um, this Before You Start page, we really developed fairly recently, and it was in response to, well, primarily lots of questions that our team was getting. So you need to have a lead chief investigator to submit the form, and people were getting through to the end, not being able to submit their form, saying, you know, who can be a lead chief investigator? What do I have to do? Um, the same with external collaborators. So it really just made sense to have this before you start page um, to help people out. And then we just go through to the overview. And so it's based, as I mentioned, on the um, project. So you give it a project title. The abbreviated project title is used for storage allocations. Um, and then you select whether this is a research project or a higher degree by research project. We're actually fairly flexible in this. So we would rather that people are storing their data. So if they're a student and they're doing research, we would prefer that they're storing their data on our research data store rather than being lost on a USB. So they can, it's fairly open as to who can apply, but they will need to put their supervisor as the lead chief investigator. I nominate faculty, I've decided that I'm in law today. And the requester information is actually taken from up the top on this previous slide. You can see that I'm signed in as me, so that is pre-populated. And the RDMP tool does integrate with LDAP and with Mint. And so from Mint, we can take information about people, publications, and grants. So if people, if this is linked to, I think, just an ARC or NHMRC grant, um, or if we have the grant information, they can just start typing that information in and it will populate the grant details there. FOR codes, project dates, um, and any of this can be updated. So the contributor space is really designed around the storage allocation. So it should be all the people who are involved in the project. 
um, but it does also control who has access to the storage. So whoever is not, whoever's in that space on the previous slide of, um, for the requester will be auto-populated into this contributors list. They can be removed. If they are the lead chief investigator, they can update their role to the lead chief investigator. But generally, um, most people will be contributors, but you can also assign someone to be a reader. So they would have read-only access to that storage. Another enhancement we made fairly recently around that issue of needing to have a lead chief investigator is the search functionality and you can search by name, email address or uni key um, and it will tell you whether that person can be a lead chief investigator and we have help available if you think they should be able to but they can't. So this is one of the main areas where people can provide information about their research data and we don't have that many free text fields. So this is a really good place for people to provide as much information as possible, um, but we do see a real mix of information coming through from only a couple of sentences to you know, a paragraph or so. And I also don't really like the carrot and stick analogy, but um, this is the carrot of the access to the research data store. And so originally it was really promoted as you could request two terabytes of storage, but we're really not, I mean, here I've decided that in 2018 I need 30 terabytes and that will just go through. But it, again, it is that opportunity to start a discussion. So if someone says, oh, I, I need 200 terabytes, well, why do you need it? Are there other services we can be offering you? Is this the best place? Um, and just start those conversations. So you can complete an RDMP just for the purposes of research data management planning. So you can say that you do not request, that you do not require um, digital storage, which is fine. We do have two types of storage. Um, we have classic research data store and we have research computing optimized storage. And I'm not going to go into that, um, but it's something you can ask about offline if you like. And here you can see that that abbreviated project title is part of the file path for the um, storage allocation. Um, you can provide extra information about your specific storage requirements and I have ticked other and have forgotten to fill anything in. And where will you be keeping any physical data? And hopefully as specific as possible, not just it's stored in my bottom drawer. And then retention period. So as I mentioned, you can also request access to high performance computing using the form and that can be updated later if you don't request it at the beginning. And then we have some more, more sort of data management style questions about sharing the type of data that it is. Can a description be shared? And what we don't have at the moment is an integration between Redbox, which is Redbox, our registry, and Redbox, our RDMP tool. So um, one option could be that you know we could have some of the metadata taken from the RDMP form and put into the registry, but that is. I believe that functionality is there, but is not something that we've switched on. So this upload section, um, we do have people who do upload some documents. So um, across the university, there's many places where you might be, or where researchers might be putting their documents relating to their research. So you don't want to have too many things in too many different places, but this is a space where you can update um, information that might be particularly helpful for that, that data. So I've just said I have a data dictionary and some software information about my analysis software I'm using. And then I'm signed in as an administrator so I can see this admin tab and both um, the library team and the ICT team can see this. So it's a good spot for sharing um, information between, the, between those two teams. And I should point out that the tool does have an audit functionality, um, but while you'll be able to see what the changes were, you won't necessarily know why. So this provides a space for us to say that we've made this change and this is why we've done it and then the researcher can submit. And this goes to their, the, whoever they've nominated as the lead chief investigator for approval, and then that comes to the research data team and we'll approve it, we'll just do a quick review um, at this stage. A fairly recent update has been that if you are the lead chief investigator and you're the requester, you don't then need to go in and approve it as the LCI. And again, that was based on feedback. We were having researchers submit their plans. They've nominated themselves as, as the lead chief investigator, and then they're saying, "I haven't got my storage. What's going on? I, you know, I don't. I, you know, I've been waiting weeks." And you'd go in, and you would see, "Oh, well, actually, you haven't improved your own plan." Um, so it didn't really make sense to them. Didn't really make sense to us. So we've now streamlined that workflow so that um, they can just submit it, and it will come through to our team for approval. And then if they're using the classic RDS, um, once we've approved it, it will now go off for auto-provisioning of storage. And again, that's a fairly um, recent update. 
So that's generally what the plan looks like. There is the researcher dashboard and they'll be able to both um, start a new plan, they'll be able to see their completed plans, they'll be able to see plans that they've sent for approval um, or if they need to approve plans. So I've pretty much gone through most of these features. Um, so it does capture data management information including about physical data. Um, you can request access to the research data store and HPC. Um, you can add and remove contributors to the project and storage. So if someone comes onto your project after you've started, you can update the plan and that will give them access to the storage. Or if someone leaves, we just update the plan and they come straight back off. Again, um, it has an export function as a PDF. So if you need to submit that either in a digital format or print it and submit it with other documentation, you can do that. And it also keeps the different versions. So you can print um, the appropriate PDF version. And it, it is a living document, so we do want people going in there and updating it. Um, the contributors is one example, but you might need to update where your physical data is being stored. And it does have a clone functionality as well. So as I mentioned, it should be a different plan per project, but if you're setting up a whole bunch of projects that were similar or had similar people working on them, you can clone and then um, edit the appropriate details. Um, so just quickly about who supports this, we have the research data team. Um, the liaison librarians in the library are becoming more involved in the data management space. And then our ICT teams from help desk through to specialised support um, and work on um, making updates, liaising with the vendor and forward planning. Um, and then in the strategy space, it's really again a partnership between the library, ICT and the research portfolio, influenced by what researchers need, want, funding requirements um, and university policy as well. So what does the future look like for us? Well, the tool's been in place for about 18 months now, I think, if my maths is correct. Um, so it's really a good time for us to sit back and reflect on what we've done. There's been a lot of changes. A lot of them have happened um, in about the past six months. And at the same time, other systems around the university are being updated. So we can really look at what else is out there in terms of opportunities for integration, um, trying to avoid that duplication of effort for researchers. We're continuing to receive feedback from them and we're really keen to hear it, what works for them, what, what doesn't work for them. Um, and really, so at the University of Sydney, um, research data management is really taking off as well and we have a new research data steward who's a fairly senior academic and chairs a strategy group on research data management. So again, it's a good opportunity for us to just reflect on what the landscape here is at university um, in Australia and globally just to make sure that um, we're supporting our researchers the best we can. So that's about it from me. Um, you can contact me. Um, I've put our team's contact email there and that will go through to four of us and also a link to our research data management guidelines as well. So that's all. Okay, um, I'm Maud Francis. I'm at the University of New South Wales, managing library repository services for about the last eight or nine years. So, as stipulated in the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research, researchers are expected to ensure that their data are well managed. Um, but to do this, institutions need to provide the infrastructure and support services. To this end, the USW IT Investment Plan is funding several projects over five years at UNSW to build enterprise systems for managing the university's research data. During 2013, the projects delivered services for research data management planning and for archival storage, and these were prioritised by academics around the university. Under direction from the Division of Research, the services were collaboratively developed by the UNSW IT and the library, as with the other universities. And during 2014, the data management planning and storage services were extended to specifically cater for the university's higher degree research candidates. So prioritisation of the investment plan for research was based on comprehensive input, as I said, from academic and research areas of the university. The top selected programmes for research data management services and in particular for archival storage of data. So my focus today is on the yellow and red bars in the um, diagram that you can see which relate to research data management planning um, for academics and HDR candidates. So at UNSW, our RDMP, Research Data Management Plan, is a web-based service built by the Library Repository Services team. 
and it was a critical component of the data storage project because the Division of Research who directed the project stated, like other universities, at Sydney in particular, that archival storage was only to be allocated after completion of a, an RDMP for the project. So to kick it off, a business advisory group with membership from academic stakeholders, IT and the library, as well as the Graduate Research School and Ethics and Compliance Unit was established. And this ensured that the services and system were implemented with reference to existing infrastructure and practice. The RTMP was developed as a second component of an existing library service, ResData, which was built with funding from ANS during 2011 to 12 to deliver records of research data sets, so publishing data to Research Data Australia. The thinking behind building a research data management planning service on an existing repository based system for managing research data was that metadata and res data, some of which is provided by other information systems at the university, can be reused across the research life cycle. Fundamental to this thinking is that existing institutional sources of truth are leveraged where possible. This reduces the data entry burden for researchers and optimizes the accuracy of the information in the plan. A further consideration relates to integration of and co-location of services for data management across the research life cycle. Currently planning storage and discovery, but with future possibilities for preservation of data um, and services for processing, analyzing and sharing data during active phases of a project. So what do these integrations look like? Starting with the purple boxes at the top, enterprise services provide information about people and grants. Res data receives this information in a daily feed from the USW data warehouse, which there is named Julia in the brown box. It's now been renamed as the Info Hub. The RDMP in the blue boxes on the left, or I think it's the left, yes, in the middle section of the diagram comprises um, a custom built user interface which referred researchers use to create and edit research data management plans. Uh, the information is stored and indexed in a Fedora repository and information from Fedora is communicated via the provisioning service, which is another brown box in the lower center, um, to the UNSW data archive at the bottom of the diagram. Details of research projects and their data, as well as roles and access permissions of personnel and research teams are used to define the storage space in the data archive. And the workflow for plans relating to postgraduate theses um, draw also on information from the UNSW student system. And that's information about the candidate, their supervisors, and the research project. So as you can see, there's a lot of similarities with other services we've talked about today. So the rollout and uptake. It was piloted in initially in 2014 with four research groups, um, 50 sessions with research committees and all faculties and the staff and candidates and schools and research centers were conducted um, during August to May um, last year and this year. And these were run jointly by the research support specialists in IT um, and another staff person there, the library outreach team, uh, member from the team and someone from library repository services. So currently we have 300 unique users, 250 of whom are staff and 50 RHDR candidates. And more than 80% of the um, plans are from people in medicine, science and engineering. 160 storage requests have been made from these plans. So where do users get help? Well, the Res Data Help Guide provides a step-by-step -step guide for users. And it's also a good place to go if you want to understand, understand the inner workings of the service um, for people outside the university because the help files are available um, prior to sign-in on the Res Data site. And I'll provide the URL for that later. There's also a website managed by the Division of Research which has comprehensive information about research data management. So you can see the top left box there is research data management planning and it links to the Res Data site. Support for library research data management services is incorporated also into services that the library's outreach team um, delivers. This leverages the relationships that have developed already with some um, UNSW researchers. And in delivering these services, the librarians work really closely with the library repository services team who built the service and IT's research support specialist who provides access uh, advice on the data archive. Information about the RDMPs has also been incorporated into the orientation to research sessions for new researchers and HDR induction session sessions. 
So I want to touch just briefly on sustainability and operational matters. So in the first instance, the board composition, I think, is really important because it ensures that the services and tools for managing research data are aligned with the university's strategies um, and practice. Having senior stakeholders on the board uh, provides the resources and visibility required to achieve the project goals. So a fundamental requirement for sustainability, in my view, is a real, really tight alignment between the parties and interests, um, the library, division of research, IT, governance and support services, and policy, infrastructure, and research practice. Okay, improvements in future plans. Um, so we, did, we conducted a survey of users um, sometime last year, and out of that, um, one of the issues that arose was that when someone had completed a research project, then gaining storage by actually filling out a data management plan was kind of, um, yeah, putting the, the horse and cart um, the wrong way around. That in fact, the planning was a little late. So we've created a reduced version, which is called a post-project storage allocation form, which has the, some mandatory fields required by the Divi Division of Research for them to access the storage, but doesn't require that intensive planning um, of um, projects of, of data management as with existing projects. So we also responded with um, easier navigation, pre-populating four subject codes from the info ed feed, and th those three are completed. And at present, we're looking at ethics and compliance integration, more sample RDMPs and the help documentation, and a clone function, um, which enables someone who's created one plan to then duplicate it um, and change a few fields for a second plan. Future plans are to integrate the ORCID feed, feed um, once we can get it out of the data warehouse, and respond to requirements of funding bodies as they arise in Australia. And this, as most of you, several of you will know, is a pattern um, in the US and UK and Europe where funding bodies are acquiring data management plans, and most of the planning tools are actually driven by those requirements. Um, further integration also with metadata and res data data set records, the other part of the system and to extend the RDMPs and metadata with disciplinary schema, for example, um, DBI. So I'm just going to give you a really quick um, flick through a couple of slides to show you what it looks like. So as I said, um, you sign in here at the ResData site. The help on the top right um, under the library banner um, is where anyone can go prior to sign in. I'm going to use a plan prepared for the demonstration, um, a previous demonstration, and I'll, so I'll therefore be going into the edit function Note that the plan on the right side under the Manage button can be um, exported as well as a PDF document. Um, you can view it, have a look at storage status, um, etc. So here's one we prepared earlier. Uh, I'm not showing the complete page, but you can see along the top of the page the plans organized under tabs that relate to project governance, data organization, ethics and privacy, IP and copyright, etc. Data organization and documentation. As with Sydney's, there's a lot of drop-down options. If the response to the question about non-digital data were no, the sections for description and location of those data would not appear on the form. So basically, based on a yes-no response in many cases, further sections of the form will be provided. Some fields are mandatory, others not, and in a, a, bill, a plan can be saved as a draft, in which case nothing's really mandatory, except I think the title and uh, lead chief investigator. Um, in this case, to get storage and actually complete a plan, although it's, um, as um, Katrina mentioned, a living document, not necessarily completed. Yeah, so here on the ethics page, um, because I selected no to the first question, further questions about the data are asked. And had I responded yes, I would be asked to provide an approval number. Um, and we're pl currently planning integration with the research ethics and compliance systems so that this information can be automatically populated. On the IP and copyright section, note that more than one copyright era is possible. So we acknowledge that um, this is often required for longitudinal studies and for research involving multiple data sets. So. And users can navigate back and forth um, at will. Initially, they had to go um, in one direction from start to finish, and that um, proved quite problematic. It's not quite the way the research is done. So one of our early enhancements was to take away that requirement to um, complete, complete the plan um, in the order it was presented. And finally, to the preview page. So that's all I'm going to show you of the plan. As I mentioned earlier, the help files are a pretty detailed 
run through the, the plan and included a lot of screenshots from, from sections of the plan. And here's a link to Rosada and to the data management toolkit page I showed you. And at the bottom there is a presentation um, which actually goes into a lot more detail. It's a um, peer-reviewed paper which is available through that DOI and it provides a lot of detail on the actual um, technology um, and thinking behind the plan. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Maud. So we've got some questions. Um, I think at this point probably uh, it would be more efficient if I just kind of open up the, the floor to all our presenters and, and uh, start. So the next question is, uh, can uh, a researcher go back and review the DMP uh, later as the pro uh, project progresses? Is, is there a mandate that uh, they do as they uh, uh, they do so as they approach the end of project. Panel? There's more here. In our case, it's not mandated to go back to it. Um, however, they are able to um, and, and are in fact are encouraged to. I think um, ideally the, the plan would be used as a way to communicate among the research team. So if a new person comes on, this is the place where the information is stored. And if something changes, it can be updated. I'll jump in next. Um, we use the term living document to describe our DMPs as well. Uh, and in fact, anybody working with research ethics approval must resubmit their data management plan every year with an annual ethics report. Uh, there's no mandate as such other than that ethics requirement though. Yeah, we just have um, that there needs to be one completed for a research project. So um, it, it should be updated. Um, but then we do have requirements around making an actual record of your data available. Uh, next question is, wondering why you didn't use the DMP tools in Redbox. Any of you uh, have Redbox installed in your institution? Um, okay, so the development on our data management planning tool actually started before Redbox could do DMPs. Uh, and I actually believe that the existence of our data management planning tool inspired the addition of data management planning to Redbox. Is access to the R drive automated on completions uh, to the plan or is there some human actions required? Okay, so um, the plan is completed and then as a second step, using a completed plan, a researcher must submit a request. This is all still done within the data management planning tool. Uh, that then lodges a standard support ticket to the IT help desk, at which point a human will eyeball it and generally they just hit one button and the entire provisioning is automated. Um, we do have a, a human eyeball the request just in case the researcher asks for a ridiculous amount of storage. Our next question is for University of Sydney uh, in relation to uh, external persons like a collaborative partners. How, do you, how, how does the system address that? Uh, so they would, we would need to generate a uni key um, for them to be able to access the storage. So that's something that would have to be managed through an external process before they can be added to a data management plan. Uh, the next question is also for you, Katrina. Um, are researchers uploading their associated research records such as uh, ethics approval as well? Um, no, most of them aren't um, because we do have our research information system um, as well as the records management system. So most of the stuff that we are seeing is specifically related to the data itself, so something like a data dictionary. But yes, we do have other places for that information to go. Uh, next one is for you two, Katrina. Uh, you have 600 plans a minute. Uh, what percentage of your researcher does uh, this represent? A very small amount. <laughs> <laughs> it's early stage. Yeah, so it is something um, that we would like to see improve. Um, because of the integration with storage um, and also having a new team come in, it's definitely something that we're promoting a lot more now. So expect to see it to grow a lot more. So before I go, I'd like to thank our speakers uh, and uh, reminder that this is a part of a webinar series in research data information integrations.